Hello, aspirants. Looking at current affairs for 30th April, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 16. We'll look at them in detail. Out of these, the first seven, eight news items are from the Sunday newspaper. So, eight are from Sunday and eight from Monday newspaper. So, the first news item is Modi Z detailed measures to resolve border issues. So, we know about the informal summit which took place between the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chinese President Xi Jinping. So, on, in this first informal summit which took place, the two leaders have acknowledged that India and China have wider and overlapping regional and global interests. So, they this merits this requires sharper strategic communication so that's what is going on also efforts would be rebooted to resolve their border row has also been emphasized on so on the border dispute at this wuhan summit which the informal summit which took place in wuhan in china the two countries have reflagged mutual and equal security clause of 1993 peace and tranquility accord so this mutual and equal security clause is a principle under this accord between India and China where it is said troops deployment by either side will take place in accordance with differential terrain and other factors. So how many, what should be the troop deployment, how should it be? That would be based on mutual and equal security, based on various factors like you know, how different, different terrain is situated in that region or what are the other factors which are there. So based on that, they would have mutual and equal security. Also, there are special representatives which have been appointed on either side and they are holding boundary talks. These are closed door talks which have been going on. In 2005, there was an agreement between the two countries on resolution of border differences based on various principles and parameters. So, this is still going on. So, you should know about the boundary dispute between India and China. So, here you can see this one region is Aksai Chin region which is in Jammu and Kashmir and this region was taken over by China during the India-China War of 1962. So this is one area which is under Chinese control which belongs to India and but China claims it belongs to it. This is a majorly an uninhabited area and China wanted access to this region to better control its province here. So this is the Tibet region of China and Arunachal Pradesh, the northeastern state here. China claims a large part of Arunachal Pradesh as South Tibet. So this is another territorial dispute between India and China. So these are the two major areas of dispute. Then next is draft mission to kickstart renewable energy storage. This is regarding national energy storage mission. So a draft of this mission has already been prepared and will be put forward before the minister and then it will come in the public domain. So this is to kickstart grid connected energy storage in India. So this will encourage indigenous manufacturing of batteries also bring up a regulatory framework for this sector. So it has this target of 15 to 20 gigawatt hours of grid connected storage within the next five years. So that is what the present draft talks of as per the experts who are involved here giving statements. So it's not come in public domain to yet. So this, what happens presently is power grids do not currently use storage options. So this, if this storage option is brought in, then it will help in smoothly integrating renewable energy sources too. Because renewable energy sources as we know, they are not available all the time. Like solar energy, it would not be available all the time. At night, it would not be available. Even wind energy is intermittent because the wind may not blow all the time. Sky may be cloudy too. So, this concerns which are there with respect to renewable energy, once we have energy storage available, then it would help in smooth integration of renewable energy to power grids as well. So, this mission is expected to focus on seven verticals, seven areas, that is indigenous manufacturing, of batteries as such to assessment of technology and cost trends, policy and regulatory framework, financing, business models and market creation, research and development, standards and testing, and great planning for energy storage. So renewable energy now makes up to one fifth of India's total installed power capacity. So problem is that peak supply of renewable energy sources does not always meet peak, meet peak demands. So that's why we need storage. So currently lithium ion cells needed for battery storage are not manufactured in India. So this is one area which needs to be worked on. And here the details are provided as you can see regarding the National Energy Storage Mission, its aims as such, which we discussed. Then next is 
Congress slams adopt a heritage project. So this is regarding a project which has been initiated by the tourism ministry, adopt a heritage. So in this, actually the private sector is allowed to adopt a heritage site as such and it will provide for maintenance basic infrastructure in this region. So this is has been questioned by Congress that how center is allowing a heritage site to be taken over by a private entity. So, for the Red Fort 2, an agreement has been signed by this with this Dalmia Bharat group. So, it has committed this group, the private sector has committed a sum of rupees 25 crore for a period of five years for providing basic infrastructure. So, what are these basic infrastructure facilities? Are like drinking water kiosks, street furniture, like benches, signages to visiting uh, visitors as such, guiding them. So, on, these are the basic infrastructure which it would provide to the monument area. So this has been questioned, but the tourism minister says that this only is about spending. The private sector is spending money. It has not been given money as such, and it is, it is creating amenities in this region. So if they are spending money, there is nothing wrong if they take credit for it. But that is what advertising is. So this is an issue which has been raised. The next is US gains again places India on watch list. So the Office of U.S. Trade Representative has once again placed India on priority watch list in its annual Special 301 report. So you should know about this Special 301. What is it? So this is a report which U.S. Trade Representative brings out on the status of intellectual property protection in various countries for its citizens and for its companies. So it has slammed in this report India is in priority watch list and it has slammed Indian Health Ministry for creating uncertainties in the pharmaceutical market. So, Indian Health Ministry demands pharmaceutical companies to provide details of how they were using the granted patent. So, there is this form 27 which the companies have to uh, fill. It's a statutory requirement which mandates patent holders to declare how a monopoly has been exercised in the country. So, this has been targeted. And Medicine Science Frontiers, which is an international organization providing medical benefits to developing and underdeveloped world. So here it says, it criticizes this move of US and says that India has been targeted because it is pharmacy of the developing world. It provides generic affordable medicines globally. So this is it. So it has long been, India has long been in this special 301. Again, it has been placed in the same list. So this is regarding special 301. So it identifies trading partners, various countries that deny adequate and effective protection of intellectual property or deny free, fair and equitable market access to US artists and industries that rely on intellectual property protection. So it's an annual review conducted and a report published by US Trade Representative. The next is Tibetan's Lord Stand of US Senate. So the U.S. Senate means the U.S. Upper House has agreed to a resolution which claims that the responsibility for identifying the future Dalai Lama, the 15th Dalai Lama, only rests with the officials of the 14th Dalai Lama's pri private office. So this resolution has been welcomed by Central Tibetan Administration as such. And it says that it strengthens the rights of Tibetans to choose the next Dalai Lama, which is done through a reincarnation selection process. So the move has been opposed by Beijing, China because it says that this is interfering in China's internal affairs. So there is the Dalai Lama too, which we know he is in exile. He is in, has been provided refuge in India. And also there is a Panchen Lama. So the 11th Panchen Lama is also a point of controversy as such. So US resolution is also calling on US ambassador to China to go and meet the 11th Panchen Lama. So this Panchen Lama is an important figure in Tibetan Buddhism. In, as such, he is a spiritual authority second only to Dalai Lama. So it means, Panchen means great scholar. So it has started since 5th Dalai Lama. The tutor of 5th Dalai Lama was the first Panchen Lama. And since then, Panchen Lamas have been appointed. And the 11th Panchen Lama, the current Panchen Lama has become controversial because the Panchen Lama which had been appointed by Tibetan officials was not recognized by Chinese government. It has been accused of kidnapping that Panchen Lama and currently appointed 11th Panchen Lama as such who is in Tibet appointed by the Chinese as such with Chinese support as such is rejected by the Tibetan authority. So that controversy is there. And if they say the original 11th Panchen Lama has been kidnapped by China. The next is how Oman's rocks could help save the planet. So this is regarding Oman here in West Asia. The, the rocks here 
as such are said to have a unique property. These rocks are peridotite, which are is igneous rocks. So these are actually present in oceanic crust and mantle as such. So they are far deep under the earth, but then they have come up, cropped up because of uh, volcanic eruptions as such too. And they have thrust up on land because of tectonic forces basically 100 millions of years ago. And they are present here in Oman and in a higher proportion. Such similar smaller formations are found elsewhere in the world too, like in North California, Papua New Guinea, Albania, etc. So these are normally below the earth and since they have come cropped up here in Oman, they have a speci special property. They can absorb carbon. So they form these veins of white carbonate minerals in the rocks. So carbonate also surrounds the pebbles and cobbles as such. So it's a mosaic which is formed on these rocks. So this process as such is natural process which is called carbon mineralization. So this can be harnessed to even absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so it helps in cleaning the environment as such too so it can turn carbon dioxide into soap so your rocks are capable of capturing a lot of carbon dioxide but the challenge is that it should be faster than done in nature and it should be done in huge amounts and at low enough cost to make it doable so the omani officials as such have been reluctant presently they have not been granting the necessary permits for this so the researchers may have to first go to california where the rocks are less accessible, but the state government here has ambitious targets for emission reduction, so they may allow this too. So this is one aspect which can be tapped in for climate controlling or climate change as such. So these are the rock formations here in Oman. The next is a blow to last hope drug. So this is regarding colistin. So colistin is called a last hope drug. So now presently we are seeing that collagen resistant bacteria have also been found in food samples. So this last resort antibiotic which is a lifesaver for humans has also been overcome by bacteria. They have also become resistant to this. So the reason for this is the indiscriminate antibiotic use. So indiscriminate antibiotic use results in greater evolutionary selection pressure on bacteria. So there is natural process of resistance developing but since antibiotics are used indiscriminately the bacteria forced to have greater evolutionary selection. So this causes susceptible populations to die and the resistance wants to survive. So that is how resistance develops. It is shown here too. You can see. So there are lots of germs as such present and when an antibiotic is used. So you know, so those which are among these bacteria which are resistant to that drug, they survive. Others are eliminated as you can see. So these all are eliminated, but the resistant ones survive. So the drug, drug resistant bacteria are now allowed to grow and take over. So they grow or multiply further. And then there is also these jumping genes and they can transfer their drug resistance capabilities to other bacteria. So this is how antibiotic resistance develops and spreads. So this is jumping genes too, which has been found in 1940s as such. That genes can move from one location to another in a chromosome or even to other chromosomes. So they are presently jumping genes are called transposons. So this is a concern here. So resistance spreads also. So here this, this has been discussed. So resistance to bacteria is caused by altered genes. E. coli bacteria has this MCR mutations. Klebsiella pneumonia bacteria. They are resistant to cholestin too. This is a mutation called MGRB which makes them cholestin resistant. So these are the concerns. These jumping genes where DNA sequences move from one location to another and help convey this mutation from food to humans too. So this is a concern. So what is required is that the use of cholestin should be restricted. And we see presently cholestin has been used for farm animals as a growth promoter. So it is very cheap. But it's extremely dangerous because for humans, if collagen resistance develops, then this last resort antibiotic is not available. And then people suffering from such life-threatening diseases may not be able to be saved. So they will have to pay with their lives. So this is the news. The next is strengthening the shield. So the Indian government aims to achieve 90% full immunization coverage two years before the target of 2020. So 65% of children presently in the country are said to be fully immunized. 
27% are partially immunized and there are 8% who are not immunized at all. So the challenge for the government now is that is 27% population should be fully immunized and even the 8% should be reached out to. So India has launched the universal immunization program in 1985. So after this, still we have seen that universal immunization has not been achieved. That's why for this further population of 27 and 8% being targeted, government launched Mission Indrathanush, which brought in an intensified approach for full immunization. So it identified 201 high focus districts in 28 states with highest number of partially immunized and unimmunized children and these were targeted under the Mission Indrathanush. So under the universal immunization program, presently vaccination is provided to, to prevent 11 vaccine preventable diseases. So these include diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, measles, and several forms of childhood TB, hepatitis B, meningitis, pneumonia caused by hemophilus influenza type B. So these are the diseases. So originally when universal immunization program was launched in 1985, it was to provide protection against six vaccine preventable diseases. So these were the six diseases, but now they have been expanded. Presently it's by 11 diseases, plus also for rubella and rotavirus diarrhea, which is provided, vaccine for this is provided in select states. And for Japanese encephalitis, vaccine is provided only in districts where it is endemic. So there are concerns presently with respect to vaccination too because parents harbor various myths about vaccination. So one of the common one is that vaccination causes neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism and learning disorders. So these myths need to be busted, mindsets need to be changed. Another myth is regarding immunization causing impotence. Such, such myths during the rounds also affect vaccination and full immunization. So these are the present diseases vaccination which is covered under universal immunization program and mission Indra Dhanush, as we said is for 201 high focus districts presently then next is india pakistan to take part in war games so this is regarding shanghai cooperation organization sco which is presently an eight member organization with india and pakistan joining as such so this have, will have a counter-terror exercise taking place called Peace Mission. So this is going to take place in Ural Mountains in Russia in September 2018. So India and Pakistan will be part of SCU and that's why they would be participating in this. So this will be the first time since independence that they are participating in a military exercise together. Though the armies have worked together in UN peacekeeping missions. So this is that you should know about SC also Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It was founded in Shanghai in 2001. Present members are apart from India and Pakistan. The other six you can see Russia, China, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. So these are the six members. Original members plus two is India and Pakistan. Then next is all villages electrified says PM Modi. So, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has announced that all villages in India have now been electrified. So, this has been achieved 12 days ahead of the 1000 day deadline which was set by Prime Minister Narendra Modi on 15th August 2015. So, this as such, the last village to be electrified is said to be in Manipur Senapati district. So, this has been connected to the national grid and now it is claimed all villages have been electrified. There are around 5,97,464 census villages in the country. And there were around 18,452 villages without electricity when government took office in 2014. So government had launched, the NDA government had launched Deen Dayal Upadhyay Gram Jyoti Yojana in 2015. So after under this now the villages have been electrified. Also it is said that around 1,236 villages are uninhabited and 35 are grazing reserves. So apart from this, now all villages are electrified. The government says the next target, so only the village is electrified. So village electrified means if basic electric infrastructure is there and 10% of its household are electrified. And public places including schools, local administrative offices, health centers have power, then it is called an electrified village. So even if 10% households have electricity, the entire village is called electrified. So that's how it is. So that's why it is said now the next target is to provide electricity to all in the village. However, also on Twitter, various people claim that their villages have still not been electrified. So not every village yet has been electrified are some claims being made as such too. 
So also World Bank says, said in a 2017 report that 1.06 billion people in the world have no electricity and the two states which are most power deficient are India and Nigeria. So here you can see the next target is of providing electric connections to 4 crore rural and urban households by March 2019. So that's another scheme is launched that is Sobhagya scheme. Sahaj Bijli Har Ghar Yojana. So this is regarding the Indayal Upadhyay scheme to provide electricity connections was the target. This claim to have been achieved. And this is regarding Sobhagya scheme which we have seen quite often. The next is nutrition panel drops Maneka proposal. So this is regarding the news which we had discussed earlier. Maneka Gandhi had said that ready to eat food as such which is provided uh, to children and pregnant and lactating women should be replaced by take home dry rations with energy dense nutrient packets which will be procured from the private sector. So this proposal of Maneka Gandhi was opposed by her ministry. The Secretary of Women and Child Development had opposed it and now the National Council on Nutrition. So this is National Council on Nutrition, India's nutrition channel, this, which is headed by Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, Rajiv Kumar. This council was constituted in Jan 2018 to provide policy directions to address nutritional challenges in the country and review the programs also on quarterly basis. So this National Council on Nutrition has unanimously rejected Union Minister of Women and Child Development Maneka Gandhi's proposal. So this is there. It says uh, for the PMO's decision and also in continuance of the existing practice as is required under National Food Security Act of 2013 and even supplementary nutrition rules of 2017, the take-home rations would not would be provided for lower uh, for smaller children. So that is for children six to th months to three years and pregnant and lactating mothers. So hot cooked meals have to be provided for children three to six years age. So this will continue as what the National Council on Nutrition has stated. So under the Integrated Child Development Scheme, Anganwadi beneficiaries, these children, six, to, six months to three years and pregnant and lactating women are entitled to take home rations. So this is wheat, soya, sugar which is provided. Also National Council on Nutrition wants uh, 10 select districts to have a pilot project initiated for cash transfers instead of take home rations. So this Manika Gandhi has opposed saying that there is no guarantee that the beneficiaries would use the money for food. So this is it. So here are the earlier controversies also detailed out what were the ministry's suggestion and what the means the secretary suggested and what Ms. Gandhi wanted. The next is survey for bullet train picking up pace. So this is regarding Mumbai Ahmedabad bullet train. So here National Council of for High National High Speed Rail Corporation has said it will intensify work for the two ongoing projects by May 2018. So it should be its aims to complete the two surveys that is Environment Impact Survey and Social Impact Survey. So these two surveys need to be conducted for the high speed bullet train project in mean highlighted here. Then next is North Korea plans to shut nuclear site in May. So North Korea, South Korea had their summit and here North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said that it plans to invite experts and journalists from US and South Korea into North Korea when it shuts its Pungeri nuclear test site. So this will be done in May 2018 as has been announced and this will be just before President Donald Trump and the North Korean leader have their first summit in which the two present leaders, current leaders would be having a talk. So, President Donald Trump had, has called for total denuclearization ahead of the meeting. So, this is a step which has been taken. But then there are critics who say that Hungary nuclear test site has already been you know, unusable because an underground tunnel here had collapsed. But the leader Kim Jong-un says that there are two more tunnels here at the test site which are even bigger and they are in good condition and now the nuclear test site closure has been announced. So, North Korea had conducted various nuclear tests, you can see since October 2006 till the latest one in September 2017. So, these are the various nuclear sites in North Korea. You can see here the reactors, research reactors, nuclear reprocessing centers, uranium enrichment centers, even suspected sites are shown, rocket launch sites, etc. So, 
this Pungeri site is the only active nuclear testing site presently in the world. So this it plans to close now. It is also located less than 100 kilometers from China. So this is the site. Well, you can see this is the nuclear test site, Pungeri underground test site. So recent findings by scientists say that partial collapse here has rendered the site unusable, but China, uh, North Korea thinks no, there are two more tunnels here. Then next is Korea's unite behind one time zone. So North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on the sidelines of this summit, which it had with South Korea, it has announced that it will turn its country's clock 30 minutes forward again to unify North and South Korea's time zone. So it was in 2015 that it had shifted the time zone and this time zone change was there it said had taken place to end the time zone used during the imperial times so after liberation korea was earlier under japan's rule from 1910 to 1945 so to mark the 70th anniversary of liberation of korea from japan it had shifted its time zone but now it says it will change back to the earlier time zone to unite the two Korean nations, North and South Korea. So here you can see the time zones are shown. So the Greenwich Mean Time in UK is the time which is taken plus that means these are the countries which are ahead of the, that time. So Japan is plus 9. South Korea is also plus 9. North Korea went half an hour later to 8.5 but now it says again it will move 30 minutes ahead. Then next is foreign fund flow till April, the lowest since 2011. So the present year is said to have been the worst for the Indian stock market in seven years because the flow of foreign portfolio investment has been only 8,460 crores this year till date. So from Jan to April. So this is the lowest since 2011. So FPI on average has been 40,000 crore each year between 2012 to 2017. So now it has come very low. So the sluggish flows this year are attributed to overall bearish sentiments, overall low sentiments in, uh, for, towards emerging markets. And India has also been no exception, exception. There are tensions in West Asia. There is potential trade war concern with US imposing tariffs on China and other nations. Oil prices are rising and dollar is strengthening. So investors feel they'll make more money by investing in US as the interest rates are rising there. So emerging markets are seeing investments falling. Also higher oil prices in India means India's current account deficit will increase. Inflation rate would increase. India's banking system is struggling after demonetization with scandals and non-performing assets. Also elections are due. So populist measures are also expected. So all this makes Indian market unfavorable for investors. So here you can see the flow of foreign portfolio investments is shown in date. So it's said to be the lowest since 2011. Then next is the last one on a wing and a prayer. So this is regarding India developing as the world's third biggest aviation market. So this is expected in seven years and you know, so there will be more than 20% growth and India will be third after China and US. So even India's carriers are increasing. They have placed orders for 1,000 aircrafts worth more than 10 lakh crore as such presently. So more carriers would also be needed. More aircrafts would also be needed. So in 2017, two Indian carriers are said to have flown 117.18 million domestic passengers. So it's an 18% growth since last year. So in, since 2016, so Indian aviation sector is growing, expanding. So there is a need for manufacture of commercial planes in India. So a task force is also expected to be set up on this. So this is to encourage local manufacturing which will also create jobs and prevent outflow of foreign exchange. But the only PSU which is for, which works under this is Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, HAL. And it has actually failed only 19 seater Donia 228 aircraft which it has manufactured. It can be deployed in regional sectors. So there have been developing countries which have succeeded. The most famous examples of Brazil, which has developed and sustained its MBR program. 
So overall worldwide, there are two major manufacturers of commercial planes, and this is Boeing and Airbus. So they face competition as such from they do not face competition, but then there are countries which have developed the aerospace industries, including China, Japan, Sweden, apart from Brazil. So, but then they are sustaining their aerospace market in the domestic sector only. But these two majors, Boeing and Airbus, supply the aircrafts to various countries. Even it is said that these two majors, major aerospace powers also do not have any aircraft that is 100% built in their country. So, there is high level of sophistication and specialization required in aerospace sector. So, there are various components which need to be sourced from all across the world, subsystems sourced from all across the world. So, the focus, if India also plans to have its commercial planes manufactured, then the focus should be on making world class aerospace components in the country and then graduating to aircraft assembly and developing commercial planes. So, that is what the article says. So, these are the news items. Thank you.